thanks very much for joining us, everybody. Um, we've got a great two days of scheduling ahead of us. And the very first speaker will be Jerry Zacharel from Rook talking about maximal extractable value, which is also uh, previously known as minor extractable value. Uh, a very, very uh, hidden and poorly understood uh, factor in crypto trading that causes a lot of people to uh, lose you know, more funds than they would have imagined or win more funds than they may have imagined, depending on which side of the, the extractable value you're on. So without further ado, let me introduce Joey. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome in. Appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. And good morning. So I am Joey Zacherl, and I'm here from Rook, and we are building a decentralized payment for order flow technology that pays you for the value that you contribute to DeFi. And this is really exciting stuff. I have a lot of fun stuff to share. But before we get into the details, I'd like to share a little bit about myself and my background and what really led to this. And it's interesting because all of these things really led to MEV at, at its finest, which is what we experience today without even realizing it. So I'm an engineer at heart. I really just love building things. Um, I've always liked building things since I was a kid. Uh, and I, I've done some uh, cool contributions in technology, won a few awards, but really when it comes to MEV and automated trading, um, I really got into it uh, automating with bots and I started with online poker bots. So I, I played a lot of poker, I used to play a lot of online poker and it became very clear um, to me that I wasn't a very good tournament player. I was playing you know, tournaments and uh, I would actually play a game uh, called a double up and I would use that money to buy into tournaments, and I did this for quite a while, and I realized I, I wasn't making very much money in my online tournaments, but I was making a lot of money in these double ups, and then I kind of looked at it even more, and I thought this would be really easy to automate. So I actually wrote a bot to play these online double ups, and that just totally lit a fuse in my brain, thinking like if I could write software to build a bot in poker, like what else could I do? And it kind of lasted a little while, and I even started making some online video game bots. Um, for MMOs, and if you guys are familiar with MMOs, the, um, they're video games where you can actually capture things that have value in the real world, and some of them even have markets. And so I was actually writing bots for MMOs that would make money and just farm resources, and I would sell them, and I thought that was cool. Um, but then later, crypto came on the scene, and, and while Bitcoin was cool, there wasn't a whole lot I could really do with it. Um, and so I kind of you know, kept it in my back pocket, and I thought about maybe making a wallet, but that just really didn't excite me. And then uh, Ethereum came on the scene and, and this whole concept of decentralized trade appeared. And that just totally lit a fire and I thought like, why am I spending time you know, playing poker or writing poker bots um, when I could be automating you know, things on Ethereum? And that's really exciting. And so that's how I got my start with Volleyfire. Um, so Volleyfire is where um, I, I was essentially automating uh, liquidity, right? And so when you think of automated trade on blockchains, uh, there's two key roles here. There's the maker and the taker. So you can automate liquidity as a maker. And this is critical because in the early days of uh, blockchain, um, there really wasn't any liquidity. And that, that was actually the reason why a lot of early decentralized exchange protocols failed is because they had no liquidity. And I realized that very quickly. So I, I dove into market making and, and bringing liquidity from centralized exchanges and other sources on chain so that people who wanted to trade on chain actually had a trading partner. Because in the early days, 2016, 2017, there really weren't many trading partners. Um, and then I also quickly realized that there, there's a a valuable resource in being a taker as well, and we'll get into that here in a bit. Um, and so how does this all relate to MEV, and how does this relate to DeFi? Well, we're gonna take a quick stop at traditional finance first, um, and then we'll, we'll touch on that in depth, and that's basically gonna be the, the remainder of this presentation, right? So in traditional finance, um, your order flow is worth big money, right? And if you look at Citadel, Robinhood, and, and the likes of some of these other folks, you'll, you'll see exactly why. Um, so um, it's very common for a market maker to pay a broker 
for the rights to facilitate uh, trades and, and basically make money off of the trades, right? So, for example, Citadel last year paid over $1.5 billion to Robinhood for this exact sort of a service. Um, and what happens here is the user, they just download an app like Robinhood and they say, oh, I'll make a free account, I'm gonna start trading, my trades are free, this is cool. But what they don't realize is other people are making money off of their trades, right? And so how does this relate to DeFi? Well, actually, we're, we're seeing the same exact thing happen in DeFi. It's just called something different. It's called MEV, right? So your order flow has value. You're just not getting it. Um, and this is actually a big problem because when you look at MEV, like a lot of people say, oh, wow, MEV, that's cool. People are making bots. I want to make a bot. Like, I don't know how many people have come to me and said, hey, teach me how to make a bot. It's like, well, you're kind of missing the big picture. The big picture is this is money getting taken from users' wallets during their transactions. Um, and that's a big deal, right? And if you look at, if you look at a, a firm like, like Citadel, um, they're not a DAO. They're not decentralized. Um, they're, I mean, they're, you know, essentially private company, right? They're not even, they're not even publicly tradable. Um, and that, that, sort of, uh, that sort of behavior is actually bleeding into DeFi with MEV, right? Because you know, this, this value is getting captured and the user is not receiving any of it. Um, so what is MEV, right? So MEV was originally referred to as you know, minor extractable value, later maximal extractable value. Really at the end of the day, MEV is value that you can extract from block production. It could be arbitrage, it could be someone's trying to buy at you know, uh, above market price and somebody arbitrages them. It, it could be front running, back running, sandwich trading, anything. It could be something malicious too. So let's, let's walk through some examples um, to give you a good idea here. So let's say um, uh, th we have two different users here. One is a user just making a trade, another is a whale. And this is gonna highlight like why we should actually care about MEV, like why is this important, right? So here we have a user wanting to sell one ether and we have a whale wanting to sell 1,000 Ether. On the surface, this is what you see. This is what you see when you're trading in Robinhood, right? But here's the reality. Here's what actually happens. Uh, a user sells one Ether, and somebody's making $10 of MEV somewhere. It could be a block validator, it could be a searcher, or more often than not, it's actually both in a combination. And the whale, who's selling 1,000 Ether, this value actually scales up. Maybe instead of $10 of MEV, maybe it's $10,000 of MEV. So you can see just how big this gets. Um, I mean, we're talking literally hundreds of millions of dollars right now. Um, now here's what happens if you own your own order flow. And that is what Rook is all about. Rook is about owning your own order flow. So instead of other people taking money from you, um, for controlling your order flow, the user who sells that one ether, they make the $10, and the whale who sells 1,000 ether, they're the ones who makes the $10,000. This is what Rook is all about right here. So we feel that everyone is entitled to their own order flow, from casual traders to whales, uh, to DeFi projects, and even DAOs, um, and especially even DEX aggregators and blockchain infrastructure providers. And they're, I think, the most unique case because it's less direct. Like if you talk about a casual trader, like they're trading and MEV is extracted on the spot. But if you talk about, like, say, a one inch or a blockchain infrastructure provider, um, you know, they're building infrastructure that is being used to generate MEV and create MEV, but they're not getting paid for it. So that's, that's quite a fascinating one. So what's interesting about this is everyone has a right to it, but the reality is everyone's actually having their MEV stolen from them, and they're getting completely wrecked. A casual trader, they'll get sandwich attacked. A whale, they say they want to put a million dollar trade through one inch, they're going to get back run or slippage attacked. Um, you know, even a, a DAO, say they, they want to rebalance their DAO treasury from USDC to DAI or something, and, and they'll get front run, right? They get, they get wrecked as well. Um, and then these blockchain infrastructure providers, they're building all this infrastructure, and yeah, maybe they're making a monthly charge, you know, on their clients, but they're not getting any of the MEV that's being created using their, their tools, right? So all of these guys are getting 0% of $600 million, which is definitely not ideal. Um, it is important to note, though, um, not all MEV is bad. Um, and to give you an example, you know, we kind of have to put on our, our maybe moral compass a bit and think about um, what would be defined as bad and what would be defined as good. So let's say you're trading and, and somebody kind of wants to sneak behind you and, and extract value. 
It's like, that's cool, but then if they could give it back to you, that would be better because your action led to that arbitrage because you traded and that somehow you know, caused the arbitrage later. Um, but then what if, what if you were trading and someone snuck in front of you and sandwich attacked you or slippage attacked you? That is very predatorial. So there's a couple different ways we can look at this. So you know, from our philosophy, we would like to protect against bad MEV and actually prevent it, um, but then enable and harness the power of good MEV and give it back to the source, which is the user in this case who started the trade. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to walk through a timeline of MEV and we're going to start um, really all the way at the beginning and work our way to present day today. Um, but before we even get started on that, let's, let's kind of build a, a little foundation here. And it really starts with uh, Satoshi and Vitalik, right? So um, when Bitcoin was launched in 2009, um, the, the purpose really was to create a, a global decentralized trustless currency and database. And that's wonderful, but there's so much more you can do, and that was really Vitalik's vision, right? He said, well, what if we take that and we add finance to it and smart contracts, and now all of a sudden we have programmable money, you can build DAOs, people can actually build contracts together and communicate. And this is incredibly powerful. And I want you guys to remember this vision um, because we're going to come back to that again after going through the, the history of MEV. Oh, wrong way. Got to scroll down. There we go. So we're going to start uh, around 2016 when Ether Delta was created. So this is a really big event in MEV because this was the first usable uh, decentralized exchange that people actually caught on to. Um, there were a few before this that kind of failed, maybe for good or bad reasons, but this was really the first one that, that people actually started using. Um, and it really kind of set the flagship and, and showed that, hey, look, decentralized exchange works and it's cool. It had a lot of problems, though. Many of them uh, resulted from just poor UI UX. Um, a lot of really interesting um, uh, MEV scenarios came about as a result of ICOs. So if you guys remember the, the ICO hype in 2017, um, there were a lot of ICOs which require, you know, it's, it's an initial coin offering where people are buying tokens for the first time. Um, but then what happens is they require KYC and, and maybe they support this country but not that country. And so there's a lot of drama around that. So then people quickly realized with how much demand there is to get in ICOs, because it was like a gold rush. People wanted to buy every shit coin imaginable, right? And so they get in there and they, they go into every ICO, whether it looks good or not. Um, immediately, these tokens started flooding the decentralized exchange market. And at the time, it was only Ether Delta. Um, and so then people started just buying into ICOs purely just to sell them on the secondary market. There was a lot of order book manipulation going on. There were bots just harvesting this um, and just, just basically just, just destroying users and just racking them completely. Um, and the, the order book was just completely cluttered. Like, as you can see, this isn't a very good experience to trade. The order book, um, it, it actually kind of encouraged people to trade at the wrong price, too. There was a lot of UI UX challenges there that uh, really didn't get resolved, and it encouraged users to just give their money away on accident. Um, and that's a, that's a pattern that you'll actually see as UI UX problems in decentralized, ex decentralized exchange. Um, so then 2017-2018 uh, um, came the automated market maker. And this is a huge, huge step in decentralized trade. So Bancor really pioneered that early on. And then Uniswap kind of took it to the next level and focused on efficiency and simplicity. Um, but what's cool about this was uh, it led to massive arbitrage opportunities because now it's like you could arbitrage between you know, a few different DEXs and centralized exchanges or just within one single transaction and one single block, you could arbitrage between Bancor and Uniswap or Ether Delta and Uniswap or Ether Delta and Bancor. Um, and there were very few people doing this back then, which is kind of crazy because you know, I'd, be, I'd be running a bot and I'd have like no competition. And you just can't imagine that today. Like now there's you know, tons of people doing this. So it's like looking back on it, like those were the golden years of operating a bot, right? Because there was just no competition. Um, but what's interesting about the AMM and what an AMM is, is it's uh, essentially trading and market making um, without, um, without needing to manually intervene. So you're, you're market making through a formula and through math rather than having to put a bunch of buys and sells in 24 hours a day, right? And so 
So what this really enabled now was uh, a lot of uh, predatorial behavior um, stemming from slippage, right? So slippage was born with the AMM, essentially, in DeFi, right? And so someone would come in and they'll say, hey, I want to buy, and they use the app, and the app suggests a slippage for them, and maybe they change it, maybe they don't, um, and then they get completely wrecked by a bot. And so this really launched uh, front-running slippage attacks, um, all sorts of sandwich trading, too, um, and arbitrage just exploded at this point in history. Um, and this is also really where the MEV arms race began. Um, and it, it really showed around this time that um, there's, there's value to be had here, there's, there's something going on, there's something big going on, and most people were really just distracted by the dollar signs, um, and they were less focused on any value that could come out of this and more focused on chasing the dollar and just capturing as much value as they could. And this really led to uh, gas efficiency being king, right? So you have a lot of bots coming up. This is when people literally quit their jobs to just focus on trading bots. Um, and gas tokens became a thing. That's a really cool piece of technology that was kind of like a side effect. Uh, it really wasn't necessarily an intention, right? So in, in, uh, in Ethereum, there's this feature where you can essentially get a reimbursed depending on how you use storage. And so someone came up with this idea where you can effectively buy gas when gas prices are low and then spend it when it's high. And the, the traders who discovered this started using it, um, and this became a tool to battle other traders with, right? Because you can, you can essentially grim trigger another trader without grim triggering yourself. Um, so this is kind of where you first see traders battling each other was right around this time frame. Um, and we also saw with the, these slippage attacks, mempool became incredibly valuable and actually became weaponized because people are now using mempool to attack traders and, and expose their slippage parameters, which unfortunately were set either poorly by bad UI UX or just based on the fact that nobody knows how to set slippage properly at this time because it's too early. Um, and then uh, super interesting stuff happened you know, in the following year. Really, we have um, all these lending protocols uh, with collateralized loans, and that, that led to this liquidation mechanic. Uh, and the liquidation mechanic is very cool, but it led to this, this thing called a you know, cascading MEV, um, where you now have uh, some, some uh, bot that's liquidating a user. Um, and then they arbitrage that on an AMM, but then that creates an imbalance on the AMM, and then someone else arbitrages that AMM with another AMM, and then that'll create an imbalance on the other AMM, and it just kind of keeps going down. So you have this ripple effect of MEV. Um, and it was crazy because um, I remember when I first saw this happening, I, I had to make that decision, like, am I going to integrate with these lending protocols and do liquidations, or am I just going to focus on capitalizing on all these ripple effects? Because there's, you know, a lot of people, when they're trading, they, they kind of focus on one thing, and sometimes that's the right thing to do, and other times you kind of want to cast a wider net and focus on many things at once. So you can do liquidations, and you can kind of capture those ripple effects, or you can just you know do one or the other. Um, and then uh, 2018 was very eventful. We now have flash loans. So if anyone has ever heard of flash loans, they're very exciting. So flash loans enable you to borrow uh, assets and trade with them, capture your arbitrage, and then repay them all within a single transaction of a single block. And this is valuable because now, in a lot of cases, you actually don't need money to trade, right? So say if I'm trading in 2016, 2017, um, I actually need money on my smart contract. And that was a pain in the ass because you know, I would be upgrading contracts constantly and you have to sweep an old contract and move assets to the new contract. And with flash loans, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, and you know, this, flash loans are better for certain use cases than others. Um, but what's interesting is a, a lot of very negative use cases actually came about as a result of flash loans because now anybody at the drop of a hat for one single transaction could have access to hundreds of millions of dollars. And this really wasn't something people prepared for ahead of time. Like when, when the flash loan was created, it was like, okay, great, oh no. And all these uh, places started getting hacked and exploited, and money was just flying around um, because people could literally flash loan $100 million and go use that to manipulate an AMM to show the price as something horribly skewed, and then they could use that to exploit some contract um, and basically steal money from that contract, and then at the end of the flash loan, they pay back the money so as if nothing happened. And so in one single transaction, you know, people over the course of, say, 16 different exploits were able to steal about $100 million. Um, and then... Uh, 
You know, shortly after there, about 2019 and, and going forward to today, DEX aggregators became uh, very popular. And these are super high value because now instead of just routing your trade through Uniswap, you might actually want to route your trade 50% through Uniswap and maybe 20% through SushiSwap and 30% somewhere else. Um, and that allows you to trade uh, more optimally, uh, which you'd think would improve user experience, which it did, but it also actually added more opportunities for MEV um, and also more opportunities for front running and back running, right? Because now, you know, people are going to be, you know, targeting these for, for using, for, for making big trades, but now bots know exactly where to target to back run and front run. Um, and UI UX is still a, a slippage problem, which generates, uh, you know, more, uh, more MEV. So MEV is still growing, right? It, it has never really slowed down. Um, so then 2019 was also a big, a big year because of this paper, right? So Flash Boys 2.0, um, really brought some critical discussions to the forefront of the world and the community, right? So nobody was talking about MEV prior to this. Like, you know, it'd be kind of talked about like behind the scenes, behind closed curtains, but there were no open conversations like this. This really spawned the open conversation about it. And, you know, a bunch of smart people got together, put, you know, put this paper together and really discussed, um, you know, front running, transaction reordering and consensus instability. And we're saying MEV can potentially lead to instability in the blockchain. And that is not good. That's very scary. Right. And, and again, like prior to this, you know, nobody really talked about it. Like people would say, oh, hey, someone got arbitraged. But, you know, nobody really investigated it. There wasn't, you know, an, a technology built to, to try to, you know, find a solution to some of the negative effects of MEV. Um, and in 2020 came around um, and, and Flashbots was released. And this is an amazing piece of infrastructure. So Flashbots really enables you to reorder transactions and it, it enables searchers, which are bots, uh, to have a tighter integration with block validators. Uh, whereas previously you couldn't do this, right? So if, if you wanted to try to reorder you know, a block, you had to be, you know, a miner or a validator. Now, anyone with an API can do that. You don't have to email a, you know, a, a miner and try to be all sketchy and say, hey, will you reorder this for me? Like, you know, you don't have to do that. Um, and so what's interesting about this is this was pretty much a direct reaction to, say, Flash Boys 2.0, consensus instability sort of, uh, you know, discussion where we want to use MEV to secure the network and prevent bad things. Um, but there's one problem with that, and that's MEV naturally flows to the block producers and not the users. And so if you notice, everyone in these examples that we've discussed, you know, who's, who's getting MEV extracted from them, they're, they're not getting anything for it, right? So it's kind of like a hidden fee or a hidden friction. Uh, and this, I mean, this exists in all blockchains, in all layers, right? Um, and so, What's cool is you can use this Flashbots technology with Rook to complement it, right? So you can get the best of both worlds, right? So you can have protection, um, and you can also support the user and, and set the user up to own their own uh, payment order flow. Um, and 2021 was, was a crazy year because um, bots started attacking other bots. And this was something that you really didn't see much before. Um, and so the sandwich trading got so bad and, and a lot of people got so reckless with sandwich trading that it actually uh, encouraged them to uh, knowingly or unknowingly program weaknesses into their smart contracts where they actually you know, could literally get money stolen from them without them knowing it. Um, and uh, a friend and, and partner of ours here at Rook, uh, Nathan Worsley, um, he created Salmonella, which was basically a, a, a contract that encouraged sandwich traders to try to target it to exploit money um, and then he would then in turn exploit them and exploit their, their, their security loops. And it's kind of cool because, you know, he's going after the predators, right? So there's, there's predators attacking people and he kind of set up bait to attack the predators. And th this is for the first time you really see, you know, bots attacking other bots. And this really is evolution at its finest, right? Because when, when there's a security flaw, somebody's going to find it and somebody's going to exploit it. And the only way to learn is to see it get exploited unless you can you know, somehow uh, detect it when you're testing, which is pretty rare. Um, and so then today, uh, we experience MED, MEV every day, uh, whether you know it or not. Um, it's, there's block reordering in almost every block. You know, not, not every block, but it's, it's extremely common. 
Um, there's a lot of people focused on MEV and focused on strategies and, and just infrastructure for it, all while the user is getting completely screwed and, and gets nothing. Um, so everyone in this room is getting wrecked by MEV, right? So what, what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, let's go back to this vision, right? So remember Vitalik's vision? His, vi his vision for Ethereum was to focus on decentralization, removing the middleman, and interacting directly with users. But the problem is, um, we clearly have a middleman, right? The, the middleman is this MEV that's getting extracted. Um, the searchers are, are attempting to extract it, but the problem is the funnel goes straight to the, the block validators, right? So this is becoming centralized. MEV is becoming centralized, right? And the status quo that is MEV today does not sit well with our philosophy here at Rook. Um, and so we want to uh, harness you know, the power of application layer, MEV extraction, and give that back to the user. And we can even use cool pieces of technology like Flashbots, and they, they, they work together very, very well. Um, and to give you an example of how we're doing this today, um, have you guys ever thought about how a, a billionaire trades crypto? Well, check this out. So a whale opened three orders of about $10 million each. The first one was on one inch, the second was on matcha, and the third one was on rook. Um, they got completely wrecked on one inch with a slippage attack. Um, they got their order filled on Matcha, but then on Rook, they actually got paid. And then after that, they sent the next $70 million of order flow through Rook. So let's, let's dive in a bit more. So the very first uh, trade they made, um, they, they sent about, they, they wanted to transact about 4,000 Ether for Bitcoin on Ethereum, and they got immediately slippage attacked. And this isn't for any small amount of value. They literally lost a quarter of a million dollars to one slippage attack. Um, and it even was routed through uh, you know, a good market maker, Wintermute. They're a great market maker, but that's not their fault they're getting slippage attacked. Right? These are just, you know, any bot can, can try to do this, right? And any validator can you know, reorder any, any blocks. You know? um, and so they got completely destroyed, right? Um, and so this, this whale ended up then going to Matcha, and they sent a limit order for about uh, 6,000 Ether to trade for Bitcoin. Um, and it was filled. It was filled at exactly the price that they requested. But they didn't get any of that MEV. There was still MEV generated, and you can see it in the blockchain. As in the screenshot here, there's tons and tons of transactions with people extracting MEV, but they didn't get any of it. So they didn't get slippage attacked, but they still didn't get any MEV. And what's interesting is our in-house uh, bot, Ninja, uh, did actually facilitate some of these trades through Rook users. Um, through Rook users, so other users were actually making money off this whale's MEV through Rook, which is funny. Um, and so, you know, but the, the, the keeper, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the whale wasn't satisfied there, so they decided to submit their first trade through Rook, and they set up about 4,000 Ether uh, as, a, as a limit order through Rook. Um, and they were able to capture $3,600 of MEV through that one limit order. And they were very happy about that. So they set up two more, a, a $22 million and a $48 million order. Um, and sure enough, they ended up making about $60,000 of MEV, right? So when they went through one inch, they lost about $250,000 to slippage attack. And through matcha, they got their order filled, but they didn't get anything. And then through Rook, they made $60,000 and got their order filled. So this is truly owning your own order flow. Um, and just looking at a few more examples, um, so here's a user who traded about $100,000 stablecoin to stablecoin at an exact one-to-one -one ratio, and they made 34 bucks. And then here's another uh, example where someone was trading four Ether. Um, oh, it looks like maybe they were trading a uh, Frax in Sushi. Um, and then there was some really creative routing going on by the keeper, um, uh, which is our bot. Um, and uh, the $120 of MEV was extracted, so that's great. So we can do some really creative routing as well if the trade is kind of weird and it involves a lot of hops. So why would a user want to trade with Rook? Well, Rook is your backstop for MEV, right? If, if money's going to fall through the cracks, we're going to scoop it up and give it right back to you. So we're protecting you. 
And same with a market maker or an automated trader. Why would a market maker want to integrate with Rook? Why would someone who's maybe running a business or an operation want to integrate some automated trades through Rook? Same thing. You have an MEV backstop. Let's say you have some kind of a, a bot that's running for some service, and you, you integrate that with Rook. That's one integration through Rook, and you're connected to DeFi and CeFi. That's right, because our bots can arbitrage through CeFi even. So if there's a, an arbitrage through Binance, they can give you that MEV right back. You're not going to get any MEV, MEV any MEV from Binance, that's for sure, unless you go through Rook. Um, and then, too, if the best price is on Uniswap or SushiSwap, our, our bots will find it. And now, how, how could an automated trader uh, benefit from Rook? Like, so let's say you're a searcher, and maybe you're integrated with you know, Flash bots and you're arbitraging today. What, what is your motivation to, to join Rook? Well, you get to leave behind all of the awful things, right? So no more cat and mouse games, um, no more gas auctions, uh, no more grim triggers and zero sum games. Um, you don't have to spend all this time on um, mempool attacks and sandwich attacks and front runs. I, I, can, I can tell you that um, the, the technology required to pull off these sandwich attacks and these mempool attacks is incredibly time consuming. Um, tons and tons of time has been wasted on, um, you know, engineering this perfect attack that's only good for maybe a month, and then they have to basically throw away that code because you can't use it anymore. Maybe DeFi evolved, maybe smart contracts you know, evolved, um, or maybe the network got upgraded and that attack is no good. You know, so there's a lot of wasted time in, in, in trying to battle in the wild, but if instead you bring your trading uh, bot into our ecosystem, um, we force your bot to take a profit because we want to maintain a healthy ecosystem, right? The user should capture MEV and the bot should capture MEV in order to, you know, cover the cost of what they're doing and they're providing a service to the user. So bots and users are working together, right? Um, and they can also focus on, you know, focus their time on trading efficiency and capital efficiency and optimal routing, right? Because why would you spend, you know, a month on some sandwich attack that's only going to be good for a month when if you focus on optimal routing, I mean, that's good forever. And becoming a partner with Rook has a lot of value because we can take your ordinary transaction flow and your ordinary business flow and we can generate MEV from it and share it back to even our partners, right? Because we feel that even partners like an infrastructure service provider or a DEX aggregator or even a wallet, uh, they have a right to MEV as well. And so imagine Rook as being the Honey app for DeFi, right? If anyone's ever used the Honey app, you know, you're shopping online, you go to your cart, and right before you hit the checkout button, you click on Honey app, and it says, hey, we found a 10% off coupon. Type in May 10, and it just pops it in for you. That is literally what Rook does for partners, for, for DeFi applications, DEX aggregators, you name it. So MEV is everywhere. MEV is around us. It's on every blockchain, every layer. Um, as Nathan likes to say, M solving MEV is like solving gravity. You can't really solve it and, and get rid of it. It just, it exists and it's here. It's part of a natural friction of having all of these unique protocols connected in all of these cool ways. Um, so we really just need to embrace it and harness it and, and use it in such a way that it provides value to the people who are generating it, rather than using it as a fee to tax them. Um, and really, this is just the beginning, guys. Um, so if you guys want to come and learn more and chat with us, we're really excited about the future of all of this. So I definitely uh, encourage everyone to come up and chat. I'm looking forward to, to meeting all of you guys, and thank you so much for joining us today.